Well, welcome to our um, webinar that we're um, delivering um, as, as part of the Hearing Medicines Discovery um, Syndicate. So, so it's great um, to be back back with you. So, so a few sort of housekeeping um, notices before we get um, get started. So we've got um, live um, speech to text reporting, um, and if you kind of click at the bottom, you should be able to see a, a captions um, button that you can click on and you'll get some speech to text coming up. So use that if you need that. Um, and we've also got um, a couple of um, BSL interpreters. Um, and again, if you need um, that communication support, that's there to, um, to help you too. Um, so I think if, if the um, speakers can sort of keep their cameras and mics off when they're not speaking, that'd be fantastic. So I think that's everything to do with the, the sort of the housekeeping um, stuff at the moment. So, so just to introduce myself um, for, for those of you that weren't at the last um, webinar. So I'm Ralph Holm and I'm um, the Executive Director of Research um, at Action on Hearing Loss. Um, and so, you know, today in the UK, there are one in five adults with, with hearing loss, one in eight adults with um, tinnitus. And these conditions can have a really kind of devastating um, impact on people's quality of life, um, you know, cutting people off from friends and um, family. So, so as a charity, you know, we are working to make life fully inclusive for people who are deaf or have hearing loss um, or tinnitus. And a key part of that is about making sure that in the future there are treatments to prevent hearing loss, to restore hearing for those that have lost it and to silence um, tinnitus. So, so this webinar is um, you know, a great opportunity for us to kind of step back, have a think about the challenges that we face in developing these um, life transforming um, medicines um, for, for, for the future. Um, today's um, webinar is very much focused on the challenges around um, preclinical models. Um, how do we define the patient population? Um, and how do we do that design clinical trials and how do we actually measure whether um, treatments are actually going to be working um, in, in the future. So that's the focus of, of today's um, webinar. And we've got some fantastic speakers who are going to share their insights and thoughts um, with us. Um, before I do um, introduce the speakers, I just want to hand over to my um, colleague, um, Dr. Alexandra Gita from the um, Medicines Discovery um, Catapult. Um, and she's going to say a little bit more about the, the, um, the syndicate and what we're trying to achieve with that before we get into the webinar. So, um, Alexandra. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, second uh, webinar um, in uh, a webinar series launched by the Human Medicine Discovery Syndicate. So the syndicate is a strategic partnership of um, uh, my organization, the Medicine Discovery Catapult in Action on Hearing Loss, as well as the NIHR, um, the National Institute for Health Research here in the UK, and the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. The syndicate was launched in January uh, this year um, with an aim to accelerate this discovery and translation of new hearing therapeutics um, uh, and ultimately to bring better treatment to, to patients with hearing disorders faster. Um, and um, we, we are doing that really uh, by connecting rapidly innovators uh, across the world, whether they are in academia or in industry, with relevant expertise and capabilities um, that they may need to progress uh, even therapeutic um, programs. And across um, the partners uh, of, of, of the Medicine Discovery Syndicate, we have um, complementary expertise and capability in drug discovery, um, hearing um, uh, and um, clinical um, as well as cell and gene um, therapies. Um, so I, I do hope that you enjoy this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, it's great to see so many uh, joining uh, as, as we speak. Um, and with that, I will hand over back to Ralph uh, to introduce our first speaker. Okay, th th thanks, Alexandra. Um, so, so, so one one tiny bit more housekeeping, and then we're definitely on to the um, on to the interesting um, talks. So, I just wanted to, to flag flag. You know, we haven't got much time, so so we're going to take the questions at the end of the of the webinar. And and so, if you'd like to ask um, questions, please um, put your question in the, the sort of Q Q and A 
box. Again, if you kind of hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you can add your questions there. If you, if you want to direct your question to a particular speaker, then add the name of the speaker. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll try and um, pre present the, some of the questions to, to, our, to our speakers. Um, you can also um, sort of vote on questions. So if you, you see a question there that you think is important and you'd like me to ask it, then um, you know, click, click on the sort of the like function and, and it will kind of rise to the top and I can ask that, that, that question. Um, and then finally, um, um, if you're a BSL user and you'd like to ask your question in BSL, when, when we get to the Q&A, if you want to kind of um, raise your kind of virtual hand, um, then, then Dan can switch on your camera and you can ask the, your question in, in, B, in BSL. Um, and then the final thing actually just to, I want to say is again, I haven't got much time, but our speakers have kindly agreed to stay on until quarter past five. So although we'll you know, wrap up at um, five, five o'clock, um, we will keep, keep um, the webinar sort of live for another 15 minutes to kind of mop up any um, other questions. So I think that's everything. So, so I think um, I'll now introduce our first um, speaker. Um, so Professor David Rabel, um, who's at the University of Washington. Um, and David's gonna give us um, a talk about preclinical models um, for hearing drug discovery. So David, over, over to you. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, um, quite early in the morning here in Seattle, but it's uh, my pleasure to give, I would say a somewhat uh, subjective uh, talk on um, preclinical models for hearing drug discovery. And it's really from the perspective of the work we've been doing here in my laboratory at the University of Washington and also um, our experiences uh, starting a small uh, company called Auricula Therapeutics. But before we get into the discussion of the preclinical models themselves, I thought it would be worthwhile thinking about how drugs are found. That is how um, compounds um, could be used for new indications. And there's kind of two major ways that this occurs. One is simply repurposing drugs that have already been developed. Um, these are drugs that have been previously approved for other indications. And it may be in the example for, uh, of uh, drugs that might help with hearing loss, uh, the opportunity to uh, use these drugs in a new way. The advantages of that, of course, are that the drugs have already gone through a, a large amount of testing uh, for things like uh, safety and function. But the downside, of course, is that uh, this collection is only as good as already knowing what the purposes are. The second way, uh, which is where lots of effort is put in, is to find new things, new compounds, things not uh, yet approved for human use, uh, but potentially uh, coming up with distinct ways of uh, curing the disease, preventing hearing loss, for example. And in that kind of effort, there are two ways that people do this. One is uh, a known target uh, interaction. That is uh, knowing a specific receptor or enzyme that might be important in the process and designing a chemical, a drug, uh, that will interact with that specific target. The second way, and one I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about in this talk is the idea of phenotypic screening. That is not necessarily know what the specific target is, but rather looking for drugs, potential drugs by the way that they change the outcome of, of, uh, of a test. That is uh, looking for something that uh, is uh, protecting against hair cell damage, for example, without actually knowing what enzyme or receptor uh, the drug is affecting. And if you think about how new drugs were discovered, there's uh, a number of different papers on this. This is one uh, that was published uh, just a few years ago looking at where new drugs are coming from, it turns out that this phenotypic screening approach 
That is looking for uh, productive outcome rather than looking for interaction with a specific target has, is still particularly effective. The phenotypic screening approach is really the old fashioned approach that is uh, trying to find a compound that prevents headaches or uh, uh, um, kills bacteria rather than uh, thinking about interacting with uh, COX-2 or specific uh, bacterial enzymes. And it's particularly productive uh, thinking about uh, drugs that for which there are no previously functioning uh, good candidates. Once uh, a pathway is understood and there is a new drug already in place, coming up with better ones, so-called follower drugs, the targeting approach has been very effective. But this phenotypic approach is, has been particularly powerful. And when thinking about models for hearing loss, it's worth considering that being able to screen for compounds that protect or restore hearing uh, in a phenotypic way is something that we really are in need of. The second thing to think about if you look broadly at drug discovery is why some drugs don't make it out of the preclinical phases. Um, and that is why do candidates fail? And you can, there's a number of studies that have been done on this as well. Obviously there's a lot of discussion in the press about the uh, drug pipelines and are uh, we getting enough new drugs through for all kinds of different indications. And I would say this study again from uh, just a few years ago is, is pretty uh, indicative of the general conclusions. And broadly, drugs fail because they turn out not to be safe. Uh, that's shown in these tan bars here. Or even though from early preclinical studies, they look like they might be effective, in the end, uh, they're not, they don't work. Now there's a number of ways to address the safety problem, but really I'd like to talk about ways to address this idea of efficacy and again, studies have been done to look at why candidates don't work. And again, I think this is relevant thinking about preclinical models for hearing loss. In 40% of the cases, it turns out that the model wasn't good enough or not validated enough. In 30% of the cases, it turns out it was a problem with a drug actually doing what uh, the researchers wanted to, but it just wasn't able to get to the right place in the body or uh, uh, accumulate at the right concentration to actually be effective. A third reason is that the initial uh, choice of uh, what to screen for, the initial indication was not really the best one to go for. This would be like searching for drugs to interfere with reactive oxygen species when that process may only be a byproduct of the initial process that you're interested in following. And finally, a number of them failed because the evidence was just not robust enough. So when thinking about uh, preclinical models for hearing loss, we want things that are going to be valid towards what we're interested in solving and have the robustness uh, to get around this uh, issue of um, um, questionable evidence. This is a typical uh, pipeline for um, uh, searching for drugs and it's rather complicated of course, but the, the way you initially come up with compounds, you have an assay that allows you to determine whether one of these many compounds you have are better than the others. That is, they may be more potent in your assay. So this is an initial rapid discrimination step. And once you find good compounds of potency, you put it through this secondary testing funnel. Uh, in particular, you do tests like pharmacokinetics, which allows uh, determining that uh, drugs can get into the body, for example, and can be cleared from the body. And toxicology, uh, looking at uh, safety and uh, ability to be uh, metabolized. I'm not gonna spend any time talking about this part, which solves hopefully the safety issue, but rather talk about this other part that is once you have a uh, lead that's gone through the initial funnel is how good is it? Uh, is it actually working uh, 
uh, where you think it is. And if it, that passes uh, that step and it's acceptable from the safety point of view, now you have to actually put it through a formulation step. It has to be uh, a compound that can be manufactured, it can be uh, packaged, it can be uh, delivered to uh, the patients for the clinical candidates. I'm gonna spend most of the talk now talking about preclinical models related to uh, hearing with respect to one specific aspect, and that is damage to hair cells, the sensors in the inner ear uh, for hearing and balance. And there are a number of reasons why these hair cells are damaged. Uh, one is the uh, problem of ototoxicity. That is chemical exposures in the environment uh, result in uh, damage to hair cells and in humans, often this damage is irreversible. Unfortunately, some of these chemicals turn out to be useful therapeutics taken by patients to uh, alleviate or cure other diseases. And these include uh, compounds like the aminoglycoside antibiotics that are used for uh, uh, severe gram-negative uh, uh, infections and uh, cisplatin used for uh, chemotherapeutics. There are also other reasons why uh, damage can occur, noise-induced hearing loss, age-related hearing loss. And of course, uh, one aspect of thinking about preclinical models is that there's a huge amount of interest in hair cell regeneration. And uh, are there good damage models where regeneration can be tested? And I'm just going to talk about a couple of uh, aspects of this. Really, is there an ideal model? And thinking about the properties of an ideal model that make it useful for discriminating uh, whether a drug is good or not. One is this aspect of reproducibility. Is the damage that you're causing uh, uh, consistently reproducible so that when you introduce a protective compound, for example, uh, you can see that there's actually a significant uh, difference. Related is the idea is the assay discriminatory that is, is there enough difference between controls and damage, enough room that you would be able to even see in a reproducible way that there might be partial alleviation. A third aspect to think about is throughput. Can you actually screen a number of different compounds? And then one last aspect that's a little bit of a challenge to think about is how similar is the model to what's happening in human patients? Now, one of the characteristics of human patients is that there's a huge amount of variability in uh, the relative amounts of responses to damaging agents for ototoxicity, for example. And so it may seem that uh, a consistent reproducible assay might be uh, at odds with uh, similarities to human patients. Nevertheless, other aspects of the model you hope will share some of these similarities. I'm gonna give one example of a recent uh, story that came out of the Lieberman lab that points out some of the challenges associated with uh, uh, hearing uh, models. And that is, it's in this rather complicated slide, I will refer you to the paper that just came out. It turns out that a large proportion of human aging can be thought of as a consequence of loss of outer hair cells. And the question then is, are the models that are currently being used for uh, animals, uh, models for human aging, do they match that? And in some cases they do, and in some cases they don't. A second uh, way to consider uh, um, models is thinking about this uh, causing damage that you can use for looking at hair cell regeneration. And there's been an excellent model developed by Ed Rubel and Jenny Stone using the diptheria toxin receptor expressed in mice in hair cells so that when diptheria toxin is introduced, these hair cells are killed. And there's some examples of what this looks like in the cochlea and the utricle, the hearing and balance disorders. After injection of diptheria toxin, there's reproducible damage. In the cochlea, hair cells don't come back, but this consistent reproducible damage allowed these researchers to discover that there was actually some functional recovery. So thinking about ototoxicity, I wanted to mention this idea of screening for ototoxic 
uh, drugs and ways of preventing damage. I'd be remiss not to mention cell culture models uh, such as cell lines and the recent work that's being done in stem cells and organoids. At this point in time, these are perhaps not the best models uh, in terms of the initial damage doesn't look to be the same. And I wanna spend just the last couple of minutes talking about some of the animal models and what we've done with, in particular with the zebrafish. Now the zebrafish model turns out to be very useful because not only do zebrafish have hair cells of the inner ear, they also have hair cells along the surface of the body known as the lateral line system. And these hair cells are functionally similar to those in mammals at the molecular and cellular level. And they show sensitivity to ototoxic drugs, including those aminoglycoside antibiotics and cisplatin. And here's an example of hair cells being exposed to aminoglycosides. We can see the antibiotic getting into the cells and the cells dying. And you can see over on the right-hand side of this slide that the uh, relationship between drug and hair cell loss, again, is highly reproducible. So this has allowed us in our work to screen for compounds that protect against hair cell damage. And we've gone through 22,000 different compounds and came up with this one here, which through a series of chemical modifications, we're able to show that it acts as a protective uh, compound. Here's examples of the second assay we did, which was looking at hearing protection in mammals. We used a rat model. When injected with aminoglycoside antibiotics, we see that there's a shift uh, um, in thresholds and that treatment with the compound protected against that. So this is my last slide saying that this ORC13661 has shown a number of uh, favorable uh, aspects in toxicology and metabolism studies. It's gone through phase one and hopefully will be in phase two for cystic fibrosis next year. So with that, I'd like to thank the people who did the work, in particular, my colleague, Ed Rubel and Julian Simon, who's done this uh, work all the way through. So thank you for listening. Okay, th 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 thanks, thanks, um, thanks, David, for, for that um, presentation. It's really, really, really interesting. And I think the, 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 the slide where you show that, um, you know, most drugs sort of fail in that kind of, kind of clinical setting because they're just not effective. Um, you know, really underlines why it's so important that we have really good um, preclinical models that kind of predict whether a medicine is going to work, you know, before we get into clinical trials. Um, so, so, so that came across really strongly. So um, I'm not going to move on and invite our next um, speaker, um, who is um, Dr. Ronald Pennings from Bradboud um, University. And so um, Ronald is going to talk about the kind of challenges um, of sort of defining specific patient um, populations. And actually before um, Ronald starts, um, please do add questions to the um, Q&A um, box. Um, so, you know, so if you've got questions for, for, for David, then um, please, um, please do add the questions or, or any other kind of questions you have. So um, Ronald, do you want to switch on your camera and um, get started? Uh, thank you, Ralph. Um, I think I'm sharing my screen now, right? Yeah. Is your okay. camera on? Do you want? Uh, I don't think I you? should be putting my camera on, right? Or? Oh, yeah. I, I don't oh, think so. Put your camera on, please. Yeah, great. Okay. At the same time, I, I thought it was not. We shouldn't do that. Um, sorry. Um, there we go. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Ralph, for this uh, introduction. First of all, I would like to thank the organization for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this lecture. Um, it's an interesting time at this moment uh, with COVID-19, uh, but not only COVID-19 has a serious impact in our daily life, but also uh, inner ear therapy, uh, in fact, is um, uh, uh, influencing our lives, I think. And I'm an ear surgeon, so I think we need to prepare ourselves for the introduction of novel therapies in the clinical field. Uh, and not only we should prepare ourselves for um, uh, using these novel drugs uh, for our patients in, in order to try to restore uh, hearing loss, but also um, to um, uh, prepare ourselves for the evaluation of these novel drugs in clinical trials. So when you are setting up a trial, you have to think of the design of a trial. Uh, you can use the methodology. You have to 
you know, make decisions on whether you're going to use an open label uh, study or whether you're going to uh, do a placebo controlled study. Um, and this is just the first step. And then defining patient populations is the next step. And that's the main uh, part of what I would like to talk about today, because I think that defining a patient population is very important for uh, the evaluation of your uh, effect in your results. Other things that are important in trial design are the evaluation of subjects before you uh, administer the novel drug, uh, then how you are going to administer the drug itself, will it be via an intratympanic injection in the middle ear or via an intracochlear injection during surgery or other ways of administering uh, novel drugs. And then obviously you want to evaluate the effect of the drug and then you need to file these results in an ECRF that you need to build as well and finally you need to analyze all the data to come to a conclusion whether it's effective and safe or not. Uh, but defining patient populations is the main topic of this presentation today um, and I would like to outline that by this picture of the cochlea. The cochlea is a complex organ. It's lying isolated uh, within the petrous bone uh, and it's surrounded by a thick otic capsule uh, covering and protecting the delicate structures inside. Um, and in, inside the cochlea, we identify different uh, sites, uh, sites that are involved in mechanotransduction, for example, the hair cells, or sites like the spire vascularis that play an important role in ion homeostasis or signaling. And this is important to realize because um, when you, for example, um, develop a drug that regenerates hair cells, yes. and you apply that to subjects, um, if you, when you apply that to subjects, David, can you maybe turn off your microphone? Thank you. Um, if you um, apply that to subjects who have a hearing loss uh, that is not due to a defect in the hair cells, but for example, due to a defect or dysfunction of the spire vascularis, then uh, the, the treatment effect, uh, the response of, this, of, of the hearing on this intervention may not be as good as you want it to be. So um, being able to select the correct subjects for your study uh, will uh, also influence your, your treatment response and, 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 and um, create a better uh, result from your uh, study. So we can do that via biomarkers. So what is a biomarker? A biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacologic responses to a therapeutic intervention. So this means that biomarkers are important for the identification of your, um, uh, of your um, patient population for a trial, but it's also important uh, to use it um, um, in your um, evaluation of a therapeutic intervention. So I've, I've listed some examples of biomarkers in hearing loss. And the first one is obviously audiometric evaluation. Just a very plain tone audiogram already tells us something about what is going on inside the cochlea. If a subject has um, a high frequency hearing loss, then we all know that the higher frequencies are more affected and that the basal turn probably shows more dysfunction compared to the apical turn of the cochlea. Another important biomarker in hearing loss is genetic diagnosis. Um, a genetic diagnosis may provide us with uh, background and insight in what is going on inside the cochlea, and I will go into more detail uh, on that later on. Other examples are imaging, thinking, for example, of the enlarged vestibular aqueduct in Pendrick syndrome, uh, taking blood samples, for example, in Kogan syndrome, you can see autoimmune titers being um, uh, increased in, in blood samples, and also perilymph samples have been taken. And then we all know that the BDNF regulated proteins are a bit increased in, uh, in subjects who have more residual hearing compared to those who are more profoundly deaf of hearing and are getting a cochlear implant. So focusing a bit more on genetic diagnosis. So in the Netherlands, we use exome sequencing to diagnose our patients. And we are very fortunate that, it did, that this type of genetic screening is fully reimbursed. Um, and we use a hearing impairment gene panel. So, so the exome is sequenced, but we only focus on 206 genes that are involved in non-syndromic and syndromic hearing loss. 
and roughly about 400 exons per year are being run inside our labor laboratory. Uh, 170 samples are being sent in from our outpatient clinic and 240 are being sent out from centers, uh, academic centers in the Netherlands, whom we are collaborating with uh, at a national level uh, in the Dovanel Consortium. And we are very fortunate because we can you also use the exomes for identification studies of novel deafness genes. So what comes out of these studies? Uh, we have seen that uh, in uh, a retrospective national cohort study that in roughly about 30 to 35 percent of the patients that we are uh, performing an exome on, we identify a genetic cause. And we also have shown that it is highly heterogeneous. It's not two or three genes that are responsible for 95 percent of the cases. It's highly heterogeneous. So many genes have been identified in only one or two cases, as this slide is showing. So if you then think about the genetic diagnosis, you also have the opportunity, especially when it runs in families, to do a more thorough, thorough uh, phenotypic evaluation. And that is shown in this slide. Already two decades ago, we developed the concept of age-related typical audiograms. And this is just a linear regression analysis performed on thresholds of uh, patients on, on the left side from families with a dominantly inherited trait of uh, hearing loss. And on the right side, this is an overview of recessively inherited uh, phenotypes. And what you can see is that with decade steps, hearing progresses over time. And it helps us to um, uh, build uh, a view on how the, the natural disease progression occurs in these uh, types of, um, of hearing loss. Um, sorry about that. Um, so this also means that um, uh, we can use this uh, to evaluate, uh, uh, to, we can use this for the counseling of our patients in our clinics, uh, but this is also very useful as a, as a baseline uh, for the evaluation of genetic therapies in the future. But there is a problem there as well, because when we look at these age-related typical audiograms, then we, sh we, we show an average, and that's useful in clinic, However, if you uh, look at what it's based on, uh, you can see on the left, you see the thresholds in 110 patients with a confirmed genetic diagnosis of Usher syndrome type 2A. And you see the huge variation of thresholds between patients around the linear regression line, um, which, which shows that, that you know, the general uh, average decline uh, showing on the right is not always re representative for the um, the progression that is seen uh, in subjects individually. And therefore, I think that even when you start performing uh, genetic therapy trials, you, ne you, you need to do uh, a natural history study as well um, 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 to, to uh, prospectively evaluate hearing over time. So going back to the cochlea and, and, and those uh, biomarkers, I think there is an urgent need for novel biomarkers. And we need biomarkers that are more specific to the cochlear site of lesion. And we can identify them via innovation, via novel imaging techniques. Uh, as an example, OCT has been introduced in ophthalmology a couple of years ago, and uh, they, have, they have been able now to, to, to uh, show the retinal, retina in such fine layers that they can actually show progression of retinal deterioration in much more detail than before. Um, studying blood and perilymph samples may reveal novel biomarkers that are indicative for a specific cochlear site of lesion. Novel audiometric diagnostic tests need to be uh, uh, developed. And multimodal analysis, where you combine several of these um, uh, tests, may also be helpful. Um, uh, and this has been done by uh, some of the ophthalmologists within our department where they used different ophthalmological uh, imaging tests uh, and that made them, uh, gave them the ability to in much more detail um, evaluate progression of the retinal deterioration, uh, which is important because you don't want to have trials that last for five years to be, to, to be able to show that uh, a new drug is actually really effective. Uh, in, in preventing progression of, of hearing loss. And finally, I think uh, when you study patients with a genetic diagnosis of hearing loss, you will be able to 
maybe reveal a cochlear sidal vision based on the fact that the genetic expression profiles uh, link a specific gene to a specific function in the cochlea. So when you use deep audiometric profile, this may be able to provide you with more characteristics of that specific cochlear site of vision. So again, audiometry alone probably is not enough. Uh, it is an important biomarker, but it's a very crude measurement. And we all know that speech perception is not correlated with the pure tone average. As an example, uh, you can see here a slide where uh, we have a figure where we have put in the PTA, the pure tone average, and compared it to the speech perception. And you can see the line for DFNA9 showing that an 80, at an 80 dB pure tone average, the speech perception in these subjects is 50%, whereas for DFNA 2026, at this moment, uh, at 80 dB PTA, the speech perception is 100%, making a big difference because the patients with DFNA 2026 probably will benefit from a hearing aid, whereas those with DFNA 9 are candidates for cochlear implantation. So we think that deep audiometric profiling, where we use psychophysical tests and objective measures, um, and maybe even combined with multimodal analysis, may uh, help us to identify novel biomarkers that are indicative for uh, site of lesions in the cochlea. Um, and this is something that we need to use on subjects with a genetic diagnosis of ears. In conclusion, I think we can state that inner ear therapies are approaching the clinical domain and we need to prepare ourselves for that. There is an urgent need to develop novel biomarkers to identify the specific cochlear site of lesion. And we feel that obtaining a genetic diagnosis for hearing loss is not only important to identify those subjects that uh, may be uh, candidates for a genetic therapy trial, but also are very useful uh, subjects who, in whom we can perform deep audiometric profiling in order to establish a cochlear site of lesion. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, th th thank you, Roland. That, that was a great, great talk. Um, you know, and, and again, you know, really shows the importance that you know, we, we need diagnostics to be able to identify the exact pathology that, that people with hearing loss um, have. Um, and clearly that's going to be critical in developing um, new treatments. Um, so everyone, please keep, keep firing the, the questions in. So, so it would be great to have as many questions as possible. So please do ask questions. Um, for our final um, talk this afternoon, I'd like to introduce um, Professor Kevin Monroe from University of Manchester. Um, and Kevin's going to talk about clinical trials um, and in particular outcome measures, which again is such an important, important area for us to, to tackle. So um, Kevin, can I hand over to you? Thank you, that was interesting. We could have done the presentation in reverse. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming you can see my slides and that you can hear me now. Is that the case? It is, yeah. Yes, good, thank you very much. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, let's start with uh, James Lind, who's generally accredited with conducting one of the first clinical trials. He took 12 sailors with similar severities of scurvy. He had six different treatments, cider, vinegar, fruit, and two sailors were given each and living under very similar conditions. Only the sailors who received the vitamin C, the fruit, uh, got better. So as I say, James Lind's generally credited with one of the first clinical trials. A simple definition of a clinical trial is a research study where people are prospectively assigned to one or more health interventions and to evaluate the outcome uh, on their health. There are different phases uh, of trials depending on the purpose. The early stage first in man trials are known as phase one. They're exploratory in nature, use a small number, usually healthy individuals and investigate things like safety and doors. Moving along to the right side of the screen, phase two trials are looking for a preliminary estimate that the treatment might be doing some good. Phase two trials might also be looking at feasibility or a pilot study ahead of a main trial. There are usually a relatively small um, number of participants who have the condition that you want to treat. 
phase three are more uh, the definitive trials, the trials that could actually change clinical practice. So we're looking for good quality evidence that the treatment benefits the general population with the condition that you want to treat. And these trials are, are frequently designed and, and called uh, randomized control trials. So randomized control trials, um, or at least well conducted randomized control trials, rank very high in terms of the quality of evidence they provide. And this pyramid structure is often used to illustrate the ranking of evidence. And you'll see that randomized control trials and reviews and meta-analysis combining the results from multiple RCTs are at the top and ranking well above opinion and observation. Although I think there are some people that have social media at the top of these pyramids. So here's a simple randomized control trial, not too different from what James Lynn did. Uh, a sample of participants from the population of interest are randomly allocated to receive either the experimental intervention in the green box or the control intervention. And this, in this example, there is only one experimental intervention, but you'll recall in the James Lind uh, scurvy one, uh, there was a variety of interventions. And the comparator or control, control condition might be a standard or usual care or it may be something like a placebo or a sham treatment. So I, I probably at this point should also add that some studies have a crossover design where participants are split into groups and randomized to the order that they receive both treatments. So they're acting as their, their own control. Um, must we always use randomized controlled trials? Well, if the effect was large enough that it was blindingly obvious uh, uh, or, or um, we may not need to use a randomized control trial, or it may be uh, unethical. Uh, there haven't been any randomized control trials looking at the efficacy of parachutes, but in general, we know that people who jump out of an airplane with a parachute are more likely to survive than people who jump out of a plane uh, without a parachute. And it would probably be unethical, right, to randomly allocate people to the, the no parachute control group. So sometimes if the effect is very large and blindingly obvious just observing what happens might be acceptable but most times life isn't as clear cut as that and we need well designed trials so the starting point to a trial is to craft a carefully designed research question research questions often take this format the pico format where the p stands for population i for intervention c for control and o for outcome and in, in this example uh, we want to know if people get more benefit if they wear, let's say, a hearing aid in both ears versus just in one ear. So a carefully crafted PICO question here is, what is the clinical and cost effectiveness of two hearing aids compared to one hearing aid and for adult onset hearing loss with aidable hearing in both ears? Uh, a trial can be thought of as having a number of uh, linear steps. Uh, uh, a pre-trial stage is where we're preparing the application and trying our best to secure funding. Once that's been achieved, we set up the trial. That might involve signing contracts, getting ethics approval, recruiting sites. Main body of the trial is where we're involving uh, data collection. That's usually the relatively easy bit if we've put a lot of time and effort into carefully designing our, our trial. We might be monitoring progress, drafting progress reports. Uh, at the end of the trial, we have to lock down the data in a database, analyze the results and disseminate the findings. And running through each of these uh, stages, I have this black vertical line, patient and public involvement. More and more, we're appreciating the benefits of involving stakeholders like uh, a public and patients to ask them, how important is the research question? How is the best way to approach a potential participants, what's the best way to measure the outcome or the documents understandable. And there's a, a move for researchers to report PPI in the methods section of their publication. So you know, did they involve patients in public? And if they did, what actually uh, changed from, from having done it? Uh, of course, research trials uh, have to be conducted within a research governance framework. That includes things like ethics. So the main regulatory body within the UK is the Health Research Authority, though each country, of course, will have their own uh, regulated body that will take care of these things that are listed under the umbrella here. So you might be uh, asking, wh why is this relevant at all to uh, audiology practice? Uh, many people probably would be surprised to learn that much of what happens in clinical practice is not underpinned by a huge body 
of good quality evidence. And if you take these two examples here, these are clinical guidelines from NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Both of them, the one on adult hearing loss and on tinnitus, asked around 20 review questions uh, about clinical practice. For example, you know, is there good quality evidence that providing people with two hearing aids is better than one? In both of these uh, uh, relatively recent guidelines, in fact, the tinnitus one was only published uh, this year in start of lockdown at March time. In both of these guidance, there was no evidence at all for about half of the research questions that were considered important by a whole range of stakeholders. And in the remaining questions, uh, where there was an answer, the quality of the evidence was towards the lower end. So there's actually great opportunities for researchers to conduct good quality trials to underpin what we do in clinical practice. Uh, now, just a little on some of the characteristics of good trials. Underpinning all trials is the need to have confidence that if the outcome is different between conditions, we can be sure that this is because of the, the intervention. And randomization simply refers to how patients are allocated to the different interventions in a trial. For example, if we stick with the, this example of people wearing two hearing aids versus one, it's quite possible that people who elect to wear two hearing aids may have a very different lifestyle from those who elect to wear one hearing aid, and this could influence the findings. So allocating people at random, of course, they have to consent and agree to this, to each condition will help minimize this potential confound. And in its simplest form, randomization is equivalent to, you know, tossing a coin and a head gets one treatment and tail gets another. But there are variations, including things like stratification and minimization. And randomization also reduces the possibility of bias uh, if it prevents the researcher, for example, for deciding, I want this person to go into the arm that gets the, the two hearing aids uh, versus one. Expectations can also influence the outcome of trials. Uh, if I know I'm being uh, given the latest fancy hearing aid, then my expectation is that I'm likely to get more benefit. And actually to demonstrate this effect, which is rarely taken into account in, in uh, hearing device type studies, we compared two hearing aids and told participants that the yellow hearing aid was the latest technology straight from the lab and we wanted to compare it to the conventional hearing aid and unsurprisingly uh, the participants performed best with the yellow hearing aid despite the fact that it's exactly the same as the other hearing aid we just screwed on a different colored case for the purposes of of collecting the data so we we uh, I mean in some ways you might say we lied ethics like to think it was mild deception that we used there. So to avoid this, it's helpful if the intervention, wherever possible, can be concealed. And a single blinded study usually means the intervention has been concealed to the participant and double blinded means that it's been concealed to both the participant and the researcher. So now just a little on outcomes or how to measure outcomes of a, a measure the benefit of an intervention. In this slide, I'm using the work of Larry Humes, and again, sticking with the idea that we want to measure the benefit from hearing aids. If life was simple, there would be a single outcome, some single measure of benefit or effectiveness. Uh, but the first thing to say is that that's not the case. Uh, in fact, uh, the analysis showed that there were three different domains here. One based on self-report, that's called helpfulness in the first column there on the left hand side. Another domain was how to measure the actual use of the device and the final domain was lab-based uh, performance on a listening test. So not only are there three different domains we might be interested in, but there are a variety of tools we can choose to measure uh, uh, the outcome in each of these domains. So for example, the helpfulness or self-report tools include numerous uh, uh, measures such as the Glasgow Hearing Aid Benefit Profile and COSI. And we also have to decide what is the appropriate time uh, to undertake that, that measurement. So the decision for the researcher is to state in advance what is the key primary measure that they're going to base the results of their trial on uh, and what are the secondary measures? Otherwise, there's a great temptation to look at the findings, find one measure that shows the really good promising results, um, and then making the outcome look more rosy than it otherwise is. 
a problem we have just now is that different studies might try to answer the same research question, but they uh, answer it using different outcome measures. Uh, some might use a lab-based test, others a, a, a patient-reported outcome measure. And uh, the COMET initiative, that's the core outcome measures and effectiveness trials, is an agreed set of outcomes, minimum outcomes, to be measured and reported in specific health areas. So uh, to arrive at an agreed core outcome set requires a lot of discussion, usually involving consensus methods, surveys, meetings, discussions with stakeholders. And this slide is showing just some of the example of core outcome sets, uh, most of them still ongoing work. So there are some for outcomes, minimum outcomes to measure for child studies with childhood hearing loss, uh, single-sided deafness, uh, tinnitus, uh, etc. And this brings me to uh, health-related quality of life measure. So by quality of life, I'm referring to sort of mental or emotional functioning and, and feelings of well-being. So there are some generic measures that policymakers like that are independent of the condition. So you could take a measure uh, and apply it to people who need hip surgery or brain surgery or, or, or hearing aids. Um, so this means that generic measures have wide applicability, but they may miss some important aspects of person's experience. And actually many of the generic measures that are used today would do. If you were to wake up tomorrow, having completely lost your hearing in both ears, you probably could still feed yourself, dress yourself, walk up and down stairs and whatever, but, but that doesn't deny the fact it could have an absolutely profound impact on your quality of life. On the other hand, there are disease specific measures that are hearing ones, a hearing handicap inventory for the elderly. But of course, we use that for hearing and you can't use that to compare with you know, visual impairment, um, uh, for example. And these quality of life tools can be used to compare the effectiveness, that's what I'm showing on the horizontal bar here, and the cost, the vertical bar of different treatment. So, you know, a simple uh, uh, outcome would be, or a great outcome would be an intervention that is both more effective and cheaper. And that would put you in that bottom uh, uh, right yellow quadrant. Terrible outcome would be an intervention that's less effective and more expensive. And that would put you in the, the, the red box. So health economists, you know, carry out these sorts of analysis of cost effectiveness and report things like incremental cost effectiveness ratios. Um, uh, and conduct uh, uh, health utility analysis and, and, and report things like qualities, quality adjusted life years. Uh, now moving on to how to interpret the findings of a trial. On the one hand, we might be comparing groups to see if one intervention uh, uh, results in a better outcome than another. We use a statistical test to see are the results, is there a, a statistically significant finding, meaning that the results are unlikely to be due to chance, not necessarily that they're significant in terms of being meaningful to the participant. Actually, sometimes you don't need to show that a, a new or a cheaper intervention is superior than the existing one. You just need to show that it's uh, not inferior to the, the current treatment. And, and if we are interested in the difference in out, outcomes for an individual, we might use to need to use things like a criti critical difference value to show that the difference is real and it's not simply you know, a test retest difference. But none of these statistical approaches tell us if the difference in outcome is meaningful to the, the patient. And for that, we need to establish something called uh, minimal clinically important differences. That is, is the difference big enough that it starts to matter to the individual. Of course, we also have to weigh that against the, the, the costs. Uh, this slide is simply to remind me to mention that there are recommended and standardized ways of reporting clinical trials. Uh, CONSORT uh, it stands for con uh, Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials. Uh, one of the recommendations is to use a flow chart, this one on the left, to show the progress through uh, a trial. And there's also a checklist of the sort of information that we should always remember to include in our trials. Uh, and to finish with, um, just because a trial is published, it doesn't mean it truly reflects the outcome. Uh, this slide shows the influence of bias on the evidence base for antidepressants. So the first column on the left is all the trials on, on antidepressants that have been registered. Uh, the green dots are the ones that show a positive outcome, red ones show a negative outcome, and you'll see it's roughly half and half. And just keep your eye on these red dots as we move across to the right hand side of the graph. The second column shows that most of the positive studies 
end up being published in the peer review literature, but not all of the negative studies. So this already means if we're looking at the literature, it's slightly misleading because uh, the interpretation is suggesting that antidepressants generally work. The, the middle column is showing that uh, the results, uh, it distorts the results by removing really unfavorable uh, uh, findings and concentrating on other outcome measures. So you'll see this time, some of the red dots have changed the green dots. It's looking more and more like uh, these antidepressants work. Uh, the next column is a spin that's put on the abstract to make it look more favorable. You'll see the red dots are disappearing. The last column uh, uh, is showing the positive trials are reported uh, uh, more frequently and these are bigger dots and these get more prominent. So if you compare the first column with the last column there, you will see they look very different. And one way uh, to address this, at least in part, is to pre-register our trials. So we publish in advance what we're going to do and what our outcome measures will be, uh, and then we faithfully pub publish it. So take home message from uh, my presentation, really three take home points. The first one is clinical trials are essential for evaluating new uh, uh, methods of disease detection, prevention and treatment. Characteristics of good trials include things like randomization, blinding, having an intervention, comparing it against a comparator with a clear defined outcomes. And that there's a, a dearth of good quality trials in audiology. So if you're a glass half empty sort of person, you'll bemoan the lack of good quality evidence. If you're a glass half full sort of person, you'll see the opportunity to carve out a research career and provide evidence to support clinical practice. So thanks again for the invite and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, th th thank you, thank you, Kevin, for your for your great great talk. Um, again, lots lots to think about there. Um, just before we move on to the um, the questions, um, I just wanted to um, just plug um, what's coming up next. So um, so hopefully, yep, yeah, hopefully you can see this. Yeah. So so our next um, webinar will be on the twenty um, sixth of November, and we'll have a slight shift. To looking at the kind of commercialized, the, the sort of commercial aspects of developing um, treatments, including sort of investment in um, developing treatments for for hearing loss. So that so that should be really great. And please do sign up for that on on the link. Um, and also, um, you know, please do get in touch with us to find out more about the Hearing Medicines Discovery um, Syndicate. You can um, Google us um, and and find find the kind of the way to contact us. Um, you know, we're really keen to make contact with um, academics, companies that are developing medicines for hearing loss. Um, so please do get in touch and we can explore how we might be able to um, help you. So that's all I really want to say. So I think we can now get back to the, to the, to the, um, to the questions. So, if, so if, perhaps if the speakers want to switch their cameras um, back on and be ready to sort of un, un mic to answer the questions. So, so I'll get started with the first um, quick question, and I think this is probably for, for you, um, David. Um, what, what, what um, in your opinion, do you think we need to do to make sure that cellular and organoid models are more representative of models of, of I guess, of human um, conditions for drug testing? Right, so first off, I think that in particular, the organoid models and the um, differentiation of hair cells from stem cells is a really promising approach. Uh, there's been a number of uh, recent uh, studies that suggest that uh, things are getting better. I think the problem at the moment is, uh, is this idea of the variation you're getting. Uh, that is, if you want something that you're gonna be able to use in a high throughput way, you need to have certain consistency uh, that gets around this variation issue. Now, there's incredible progress being made in organoids and other um, systems. For example, in intestinal organoids, there was a recent publication that just came out a couple of weeks ago in Nature from uh, uh, the Liberali lab that uses uh, um, modern um, classification techniques uh, to be able to extract information from uh, analyzing these types of cultures. And I think applying those kinds of methods to uh, inner ear organize may be a really promising way forward. So yeah. uh, okay, watch great. the space, I would say. <laughs> great. And so, so David, while, while, while your mic, mic switched off, 
Um, so I, I guess another question I you know, came across when I was listening to your talk is you spoke a lot about um, sort of ultra toxicity and maybe sort of noise induced hearing loss. Um, but, but what about age related hearing loss? So obviously that's the kind of the big, the big market and you know, that, that's what people have. I mean, do, do you have a, any sort of comments on what models are appropriate for people developing medicines for age related hearing loss? Yeah, I think that is also an excellent question. Um, there's a lot of uh, analysis of what exactly is happening in age-related hearing loss. I briefly mentioned the work, uh, recent work from the, the Lieberman group uh, looking at human temporal bone and comparing to uh, 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 audiograms and reanalyzing uh, the relative role of hair cell loss in contrast to uh, thinking about um, stria and endocochlear potential. And it's a quite different view. I'd recommend looking at that literature. Um, but it also shows that the huge amount of variability of what we think of as age-related hearing loss is quite likely not going to be one thing, but multiple things. It's the problem of people experiencing all kinds of different things across their life that makes this variation really big. There's some interesting animal models, the, the rat models, particularly the Fisher 344 rat uh, has, has some promise. Uh, it's something that's challenging to think about in terms of uh, doing a prospective search for models just because it does take a long time. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. So, so um, I guess a question for, for you, Roland. Um, so, so someone, someone's asking um, why, I guess, the, the sort of word comprehension changes were so different between DFNA9 and DFNA2026 patients. Um, so I guess, you know, what, what other factors, as, apart from just genetic factors, could be um, affecting, the, you know, patients' understanding of words? I think... Probably the, the genetic background is the most important reason why there is such a big difference between these two groups. The, um, the DFNA 2026 uh, phenotype is caused by mutations in the gamma actin uh, protein encoding the ACTG1 gene, which is only expressed in the hair cells, whereas uh, DFNA 9 is caused by mutations in the Koch gene, and uh, that's um, uh, expressed in the complete cochlea everywhere. And it's an extracellular matrix protein that, um, that is depositing inside the cochlea and, and disturbing the function at, at, at a broader level inside the cochlea compared to, to uh, the gamma actin protein. So, so I think, but I'm not a molecular biologist, but I think it's more likely to be um, um, that that difference is caused by this genetic background and the difference in expression level of these proteins inside the cochlea. Um, uh, and that's also something that we have seen from studies on uh, uh, speech in noise, um, and that, that we could not really correlate that to the underlying uh, pure tone audiogram, but we could correlate it to the underlying genetics. Uh, so the cochlear distortion factor that we evaluated there was, was indicative for a more genetic background cause of the differences that we have found uh, compared to, um, the, uh, yeah, to compared to the, the just the, the pure tone audiogram. Yeah. yeah, 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 thanks Roland. And, and I suppose a question for, my, for myself is, in, in your talk, you, um, you spoke a lot about sort of different psychoacoustic kind of tests and you know, dif different ways of measuring hearing. And, and I was wondering, I mean, how, how much can you track that back to the preclinical models that we were discussing? And you know, can, can we use the same psychoacoustic tests um, that are used in, in the clinic and in, in audiology, also in the, the preclinical models. Yeah, I've got a great example of that. We, um, we studied a couple of years ago families with DFNA 13, which is a dominantly inherited mid frequency hearing loss. Um, and the gene is involved in the tectorial membrane. And uh, what we saw in these subjects that we've tested. Uh, are with loudness scaling. So they have to scale how loud uh, a sound is. We didn't see any recruitment in these patients. So that means that um, the tectorial membrane, when it's affected, it's disturbed. And that was seen in preclinical or in mouse models of, the, of this uh, specific type of hearing loss that was seen as well. And it leads to some kind of a 
conductive hearing loss inside the cochlea. And um, so uh, what, what is so interesting is that this also has um, repercussions for rehabilitation. So these subjects who, uh, whose um, loudness scaling is, is going as parallel as in normal hearing individuals, it also means that when we uh, give them a hearing aid, then uh, even in the at, at, at louder, higher frequencies or higher levels, you still should be pumping up your hearing aid more like you do in a, cough, in, in a conductive hearing loss. For example, if you provide a subject with otosclerosis with uh, a hearing aid, then you, um, you know, you, if you have recruitment, then um, you have to be careful with pumping up all the, because it, or it, it becomes too loud uh, uh, too soon. But in these kind of cases, you just have to pump it up so they can hear it better, uh, like in otosclerosis. So I think that connection between uh, mouse or mice model uh, genetic background uh, is actually shown uh, in, in, in this kind of study. Yeah, okay, great, great, thanks. So, so, so I guess moving on to on some questions for, for you, Kevin. Um, how, I mean, so, so we've sort of spoken a bit about genetic profiling um, in, in this afternoon's talks. Um, so we, we have a question asking how common is genetic profiling currently within audiology? Is that a, a sort of a routine thing? Yes, I think within the UK, it's not particularly routine or it's a panel for a limited number of, of genes. Uh, that There is a move to increase uh, genetic testing. There are now national uh, clinical genetic centers around the country. And I, I have a colleague in Manchester who believes that we should be doing a genetic screening on newborn babies, not just their functional test, uh, because some people are passing the test that might have a progressive hearing loss or, or a mild hearing loss, or getting more specific information really along the lines that I think Ronald was just des describing there. More specific information about the cause of the hearing loss will personalize treatments more. So I think we're moving in that direction. I, I know there's often interest in the media about what do uh, the public think about getting their genetic profiles and what if it's reported that they've got some health condition and will it affect their insurance and stuff. Actually, the work that I know has been done suggests that actually the public, as long as it's handled carefully, are generally in favour. It's more professionals who think we need to be uh, very careful about this. So I think it's going to uh, increase, Ralph. If just w while I have the microphone, someone's pointed out that I had an error in my slide that the national guideline for the hearing loss was 2018, not, not 1998. It's just, it probably aged me 20 years be, being involved in that. And one other quick point is someone's asked about where to get experience in clinical uh, trials. And actually a lot of the, in the UK, the clinical trial units run courses. And I know uh, from first-hand experience that the Nottingham Clinical Trials Unit runs an annual course on clinical trials and it's held in well, high regard. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, thank you. And, and so I suppose, and I suppose the, the kind of the next question is sort of builds on that, I suppose, doesn't, well, not builds, but it's in the same um, sort of vein around, you know, obviously genetics could be an important sort of diagnostic in, in the future. But, but do you think there, there are other sort of key sort of psychometric type tests that will be important in selecting the right sort of drug for the right patients? Um, I, I, don't, I mean, Kevin, do you want to? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's possible. I have to say, in general, I've been disappointed by psychometric testing, that it generally hasn't made much difference to currently, for example, to how we fit hearing aids. Everything relates back to the pure tone threshold. The poorer the hearing level, the more difficulty you have in these other measures. It would be great to think we can improve on this, because if you take, let's say there are, there are four uh, sites of damage in the inner ear and they're all independent either somebody has an outer hair cell problem an inner hair cell problem problem with the synapse or a problem with the, the neurons you know if, if we have uh, uh, drug treatments that are going to target one of these and i'm assuming they're all independent then we really want good biomarkers to say well these are the people that just have the outer hair cell problem or these are the people that have the problem with the synapse we're not there yet and it's a bit of a barrier and you know one of our earlier speakers says we, I think it might have been wrong again, we really need these novel biomarkers so that we can move from this kind of generic, give everyone the same thing, give everyone steroids for sudden hearing loss and see what happens to really 
personalize it. So I, I think there is a need. I'm not convinced it will all be from psychometrics. I think there are other uh, biomarkers that we'll use, but collectively putting them together is surely got to be the way forward so we can personalize treatment and reduce the variability and outcome that we currently see. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, great. So, um, so, 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 Dave, David, the, the next question I think is, is, is for you. So, so, it's a, so it's a tricky, it's a tricky one, and but obviously, you know, people with hearing loss, um, you know, are, are really keen to understand or get a feel for, you know, when when these exciting treatments that we're talking about are likely to emerge. I mean, in, in your in your sort of view and and with with, you, with your sort of insight. Um, I mean, do you think we'll see treatments in the next 10 years for sensory neural hearing loss? Yeah, that, they're, they're, as, as is mentioned in the um, question itself, they're mentioned the FX322 trial that uh, frequency uh, has uh, underway in beginning phase two. Uh, so they're certainly promising. There's a lot of efforts going on. I think there's... Uh, likelihood going to be good um, treatments for potentially prevention uh, associated with cisplatin, for example, the SDS uh, approaches, for example, or hopefully again for aminoglycosides. But restoration, I think, is still going to be a big challenge. Um, but certainly a lot of work going on in this uh, area and uh, hopefully some promise too. So. Okay, let's we'll, we'll, we'll hope, cross our fingers and, and, and hope for the best. Um, so, so I think that David, you, you had a, there was another question just um, moved. So yeah, so so with the the rat model that you um, presented in your sort of penultimate slide, um, so so did the compound repair damage after it was done, or was it a preventative? It was indeed uh, preventative. I did rush through that. Yeah, it, it was it was preventative. It was. Uh, it was co-treatment, um, and in fact, our our uh, evidence suggests that post-treatment after damage is done uh, has no effect. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank. Thanks for that. And and, and I suppose just talk, talking about sort of re regeneration, um, I think I think you you, you presented a, a a model for testing um, drugs that might re you know stimulate re regeneration. Um, do, do, do you think, I mean, what, what do you think is the kind of the best model for people who are, who are wanting to test approaches to regenerate um, yeah, themselves? I, mean, that, or, yes. mm, I, th I think that's an interesting and challenging question. I think um, certainly uh, treatments uh, that we know about now have at best moderate effects. Uh, so that's a promising place to start, but it means you need to be able to distinguish moderate effects from the background. Um, I mentioned that PAL4F3 DTR mouse, and one of the particularly uh, valuable aspects of that model is that the damage itself is very reproducible, which means you can then detect differences uh, if you're trying to promote regeneration. Some of the other models uh, may be closer to what's happening to people. If you treated a uh, rodent with aminoglycosides, obviously that might be more similar to people who had lost it due to ototoxicity. Uh, but the challenges then become that there's much more variation then in trying to tell that difference becomes a problem. Yeah. I think a big challenge is that probably what is um, going to allow regeneration to occur is, is what is uh, left behind. That is what the surrounding cells that, that aren't hair cells uh, have the capability of doing. And those things change over time. They change uh, dependent on um, uh, the conditions of initial damage. And so there's a lot of variability there that makes it quite difficult to choose uh, what model might be best. And that might be a place where the DTR model, for example, falls down. It's quite clean at killing hair cells, but is that a good match for what's going on in the real world? Nevertheless, I think uh, having a clean baseline is really the first step. I think some of the past reported work that's shown promising that hasn't uh, held up has, uh, a run into this wall of uh, trying to uh, uh, um, be reproducible. Yeah. 
Okay, great. great. That's really, really, really helpful. And, 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 I, and so I think this will be our, our last question, and it's from John, um, and it's probably for you again, David, on, uh, um, you're obviously popular. Um, but as a, as a treatment for hidden hearing loss, um, sort of underdevelopment too? Is... Yeah, that's a great question. And so uh, there's lots of recent work, obviously, on this idea that hidden hearing loss that might play important roles in uh, uh, being able to discriminate speech and noise and other aspects uh, is due not to loss of hair cells, but rather uh, to damage between the connections between the hair cells and the nerves that innervate them. Uh, and that problem of re uh, again, there's many uh, uh, groups working on that. And given that uh, there's a broader field of re in neuroscience, it may well be uh, that there's going to be some good lessons that will cross fertilize. Uh, there's a number of groups looking at growth factors, for example. And so th this may be an area that has, uh, uh, is going to potentially show significant pro promise in the near future. And so uh, different than trying to restore a health hair cell that's missing, it's trying to uh, uh, bring back a function uh, that was uh, originally there when the cell players are still present. <laughs> Thanks, David. So, so, so I think I think we probably have kind of stretched um, our, our webinar as, as as long as we as long as we can. I think, but but um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank our, our three speakers um, for for their contributions this afternoon. It's been really fascinating. Um, I've I've learned lots, and I'm sure other people have too. Um, also, thank you for the communication support. Um, that, that's great. Thank you for for your help. Um, and, and as I said before, I mean, do please reach out to the Hearing Medicines Discovery Syndicate. You know, we're really keen to help any innovator who's got um, ideas for developing treatments. So um, with that, I shall bring it to an end and um, have a good evening or a good, a good day if you're in America. <laughs> so goodbye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>